So is this, yes, it's working. Okay. Um, I'm starting at 50. Okay. Um, well, so um, thank you for allowing me to give this talk here. Um, my talk will be about, about counting the number of trigonal curves of genus 5 over finite fields. And first I'll explain why we want to do this. And then I'll say a bit about how we can see these trigonal curves as uh, plane curves. And then I'll describe how we, display, how we count these plane curves using a modified sieve principle. And these methods are similar to uh, the ones by Jonas Bergström, when, which he used when he did um, the case where the genus is three and non-hyperliptic curves. Okay, so first of all, why do we want to count these trigonal curves? Well, we are interested in the cohomology with rational coefficient of the moduli spaces, and in my case of M5 bar. And there is this thing called the Hodge-Euler characteristic in mixed Hodge structures. And I'm not going to say much about it because Ursula will uh, speak about this tomorrow. And um, it is defined um, uh, using uh, compactly supported cohomology. And you can sort of think about it as, a, as the other characteristic, but instead of an integer, it's a polynomial. And instead of taking dimensions of cohomology, you take the dimensions of the mixed house structure. And in the case of M5 bar, uh, we have that it is smooth and projective. And so this mixed heart, stru mixed heart structure is actually a pure heart structure. And so we have purity, and that means that we have this equivalence between knowing this, this Hodge-Euler characteristic and knowing the cohomology with the heart structure. And the nice thing about the Hodge-Euler characteristic is that it relates to the Hodge-Euler characteristic of M5 and the Hodge-Euler characteristics in the boundary. But for the other characteristics in the boundary, we need to take as an equivariant Hodge other characteristics. Okay. So, well, these, in the, um, these as an equivariant Hodge other characteristics in the boundary, they are all known except for two cases, which of course are the cases with the highest genus. So they are except M41 and M42. Um, so there's still work to be done, but I'm mainly looking at uh, M5 at the moment. And the nice thing is that if the number of points of a finite field, um, so the number of points of a space over a finite field, if this is a polynomial, so if this is a polynomial with integer coefficients, then it gives the Hodge Euler characteristic. And well, the question is now, of course, is this true for M5? So is M5 polynomial? And um, the answer is we do not know for sure. But uh, we can also ask, is M5 bar polynomial? And it turns out that this is the case if um, M5 bar only has state structure. And the state structure that Ursula talked about today. And this is because we, again, here have used the fact that M5 bar is smooth and projective. And now the question, is this true? Well, this is true up to big conjectures. Uh, 
And the way the argument goes is there is this um, classification by Chenevier and Long from 2014 of um, algebraic cuspidal representations of the projective general linear group. And then you can use Langlands conjecture and fontaine masur conjecture to translate this to L. Eddick Galois representations. And then this corresponds to the hot structures. And then what you get is that for in dimension 12, which is the dimension of M5, the only non tate things that can appear are cusp forms. And you cannot have cusp forms on something that is unirational. And M5 and M5 bar are unirational. So then if these conjectures hold, we have that it's polynomial. And then that means that counting the number of points over finite fields will give us this hodge euler characteristic. But um, this is just, this is not really a problem that it is up to conjectures. Because if we can count these points, um, then we can see if it's a polynomial or not. We do not really need the conjectures. The conjectures are just there to give us an idea that it's a good idea to actually even try this. Because, uh, well, because you have this direct, then you have this nice uh, formulation of the hodge euler characteristic. And things that are polynomial are generally easier to count than things that are not polynomial. OK, so how do we try to count then the number of points of M5? Well, we can um, look at the conality of the curves. We have hyperelliptic curves, we have trigonal curves, and we have the rest. There's q to the ninth hyperelliptic curves, and there's q to the eleventh plus q to the tenth minus q to the eighth plus one trigonal curves, and the rest is still unknown. I'm currently looking at this, and this is my. Uh, result, which is the topic of this talk. And so how do we get this result? Well, as I mentioned, we will look at plane curves. So we have this correspondence between um, smooth, uh, trigonal, K curves, of genus 5. And projective plane K quintics that have a unique singularity. And it is of delta invariant 1. So, and how do we get this correspondence? Well, if we have a trigonal curve, then it has a G13. We take the visor in the G13. We look at its dual linear system. Then by riemann roch this is a G25. And so we have a plane uh, quintic. Then we can use the genus degree formula. Oh, this is five, the genus, this is six. So this must be one. So we have one point with delta invariant one. And the other way around, if we have such a plane quintic, then you get that the genus is five. And if you take a line through the unique singularity, then this will intersect the plane quintic in three other points. And so the pencil of lines through the singularity will give it G13. So the curve is trigonal. So if we now denote this space by T, then what we actually want to count is the number of curves in T. But then we need to divide by the number of elements in the projective of the general linear group. Because, well, similar to what Ursula mentioned in the first uh, talk, um, when you have these projective curves, you need to divide by the uh, projective general linear group to get the moduli space. So, okay, so now how do we count these curves? Well, we look at the type of the singularity. It can be like this, a node, or it can be a cusp, a cusp. And if it is a node, we can further specify whether it's a split node or a non-split node. 
And a split node is a node where the tensions are defined over K, the ground field. And a non-split node is a node where they are defined over a uh, degree to field extension and they form a conjugate pair. Well, uh, you can count these all separately, these cases, and they are very similar to count, but for, for the rest of this talk, we just look at the split nodes. So if we have such a split node, then what we do is we apply a k-linear transformation. K-linear change of coordinates, if you will, of coordinates that sends the node to this fixed point that we just choose, 0, 0, 1, and the tangents, they go to x and y. where x, y, z are the uh, coordinates of the projective uh, plane. Okay, so we want to count, uh, if we can now count all the curves that look like this, then we can just uh, multiply by the, you know, the appropriate subgroup of the projective linear group that corresponds to these linear transformations. So this is what we then actually want to count. And how do we do this? Well, I'll just erase this because I need a little more space. Um, we do this using the sieve principle, and for this I have a little bit of notation. We write curly C to be the space of, um, of all projective plane K quintics that have a singularity, so basically the cur those type of curves, a singularity at, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this must be a node, not just any singularity, a node at 0, 0, 1, with tangents x and y. And, but uh, these spaces are different because these curves can also have more singularities. Uh, and we only want the ones that have precisely one singularity. And so what we do is we apply a sieve principle where we take all these curves and then we uh, add and subtract various loci of uh, curves with singularities. So we define, well, if we have some points in P1 up to Pn in P2, then this is, um, this is the space consists of, uh, that consists of curves that have singularities at P1 up to P2. At Pn. And so on, Pn. So, okay, so now we can describe the sieving method. We take all these curves, and then for every point in P2, um, so every k point, P2k, but we need to be careful because we don't want to take um, this fixed point that we, that we chose. So for any such point, we subtract all the curves that have a singularity at that point. And now if a curve is uh, smooth outside of the fixed point, it has been counted once here and not been subtracted afterwards. If a, count, if a curve has one singularity outside of the fixed point, it has been counted once and subtracted once, which is fine because then uh, we are not counting it. If a curve has two singularities outside the fixed point and they are defined over k, then it has been uh, counted once, subtracted twice, once for each singularity, so we need to add it again. So we get well, a pair of such points. So, well, the same thing here. and they are not equal. And then so we then subtract all the curves that have singularities here. And then if we have uh, three k points, we need to, well, here we add them, so we need to subtract them again if they have three, and then if we have four, we need to add them again, and we can go on. And if we have, for example, a conjugate pair of points, 
we need to subtract those cases, and you can also have, for example, a conjugate triple and the conjugate pair and, then, and the k point, and you have all these different um, combinations of points, and you need to consider all of them. And then when you go on and on, you are the idea is that you are left with the curves that are completely smooth outside of the fixed point. But the problem is that this does not terminate, because there are curves that have infinitely many singularities. For example, this curve. You can have um, three lines, and then one big double line. And so this, has, uh, this is a quintic. You can take one of these three to P of X node, and then every point on this double line will be a singularity. So um, you need to stop at some point. And then for all the curves that you have not considered yet, you need to actually compute them by hand, or at least that's what I did. And then, uh, so you compute by hand how much of those curves there are, and then you just do the combinatorics and then add and, or subtract them to make sure that in total they have been counted zero times. And then when you do this for all these types, you get, in the end, all, only the curves that are completely smooth outside of the fixed point. So now the question becomes, where do you stop? Well, a natural point to stop would be at um, 10 points in total, so the fixed point and nine others, because you can have at most 10, 10 points when you don't have a double component, which looks something like this case, where you have five lines. Um, but the problem is that these spaces, these CPs, CP, Q, et cetera, they become increasingly difficult to uh, compute as the number of points grows. So, in fact, I stopped at um, five points. So, the fixed point and five more points I'll go up to the fixed point and five more points. And then I did the rest by hand. So, that's a lot of cases. Um, but yeah, that's basically what I did. And then you get this nice formula, which I said at the start, plus q to the 10th minus q to the 8th plus 1. And uh, well, because there's so many cases, it's nice to have some kind of check that you're doing the right thing. And so I wrote a computer program, and that was able to check if this is correct for q is 2 and q is 3. So that's a nice check. And of course, when you can, um, if you can compute everything, like the other um, the other parts of M5 and M41 and M42, then you can combine all this information together, and then you would have M5 bar, which uh, and there you have Poincaré duality, so that would also be a check because then the uh, then you would have need to have symmetry in the cohomology. So if you do not have that, then you know you are wrong. Um, so now I can try to give an example of one of these cases and show how you count them. So. Well, we just look at, um, I'll just pick a case. We have, we take a conic, we take two lines tension to the conic, and we take a third line that is not tension to the conic. We have, in total, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. Well, we just take the case where everything is over k because that is the simples. Uh, seven k points. So, and one of these is the node, and you need to consider that these cannot be the node, these two tension points. Uh, and then you can count, okay, how many uh, of these curves are there in P2? Well, first you take the conic, so take the conic. Well, I'll just write number of conics because I am lazy. But um, the idea is, it's very simple, you just take all the conics, which is the P5, and then you subtract all the singular ones, so those are the pairs of lines, the double lines, and the conjugate pairs of lines. And then you get this, uh, you know, this, this formula. And then you take two points on the conic. So you can take this point and this point, for example. And, uh, well, how, and then you take the tensions at those points. So in how many ways can you do this? Well, you, there are, um, the conic in P2 is a genus zero curve. So there's a P1 of points. And then we just choose two. And then we need to choose the third line, but we need to take it in such a way that the intersections with the conic are k points, because if you just take any line, then this might be a conjugate pair. So we just choose two k points on the conic, and we take the line through them. So that gives 
P one K. Of course, minus two because we don't want to choose the points that we already chose before, and then we choose two more points. But now we need to be careful because if the characteristic is not two, then um, we can have this. That when we take these two points, that the line we take through them will go through this point, this intersection of the two tangents. And this is clearly a very different case. So we do not want to count this, so we need to subtract this case. So how do we do that? Well, we just take, so we, when we have this, we just take any k point on here, and then for every such k point, there is a line through this k point that intersects here in another k point. So we need to subtract, again, the number of k points, but now we do not need to choose two. And again, we do not want to choose the one that we had before. I, will, I should erase this. But now if we choose this point or this point, we end up with the same line, so we get every line twice, so we divide by two here. So we have this. But when the characteristic is two, so um, characteristic is two, then basically this cannot occur. Oh, I'm sorry. When you have this, then any line through this point will be tangent to the conic in characteristic two. So this case cannot occur. So then it's just enough to just take this part basically. So and just not, don't take this part. So that's basically this case. And um, okay, now I can, if I have some time left, I can maybe say a bit about why these spaces become harder to compute as you go on. Um, okay. So the thing is, we, we first look at what this space is. Okay, so the total space of plane quintics is a P20 because there's 21 monomials of degree five. Then when you, um, when you take a look at that space, well, what was the definition? You have this point, zero, zero, one. So that needs to be on the curve, which is the condition, well, so z to the fifth is zero. And here I mean that the coefficient of z to the, set to the fifth is zero. And then you, it needs to be a singularity, so you have this condition and this condition, and you have the condition that it's a node, and the tangents are x and y, so you have more conditions. And this is a non-zero condition, because that tells you that the tangents are x and y, and if this would be zero, then we would not have a node, but something of higher multiplicity. And so you see, well, you have these five conditions that the coefficients are zero, so you get a P15, and then you have this non-zero condition, and you get an A15. And then every point you add here will uh, be another singularity, so it will be three more conditions. Because one for the point being on the curve, and two more for it being a singularity. And so you can add five more points, and then you end up at A0. And then if you'd want to add more points, well, you would get neg negative dimension, so this does not really work. And this corresponds to the fact that up to five points, you can always find a way where these points are in general position. But if you take more than five points, this is not so, uh, you, you just, it doesn't work. And um, so when, so these cases are very nice to compute because up to five points you can find general position, but then you might ask, what if the points are not in general position? And if they are not in general position, then it turns out that there's some combinatorics at play and they all cancel. And this has something to do with the uh, uh, hessel weyl set of uh, formula. Because all the sums here, if you take all the sums um, of the coefficient, um, if, well, if you look at the combinatorics and you look at the weights, uh, the things you get for a certain weight, then this somehow generate, um, generates the one divided is generated by one divided by the uh, Hasselwell zeta function. Okay, so um, I think that's uh, that's it. Are there any questions? I should, I should, we should